Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. It is the Monday after the Feast of the Resurrection, which was yesterday, Easter Sunday. Do pray this finds you well. A uh, couple of things. Um, Bible study begins tomorrow, uh, resumes tomorrow after our Easter break. It was a short break. So 9.30, we'll continue our discussion of the Divine Liturgy. And then at 6 o'clock, we'll have, and it's online only at 6 o'clock, it is our discussion of the Lutheran Confessions. We're reading through the Lutheran Confessions. We are in the Apology to the Book of, uh, the Apology in the Book of Concord, the Apology to the Augsburg Confession. It's a fascinating work and very beneficial to read what we confess and what we, and why we confess what we do is Lutheran. It's all drawn, of course, from the Word of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. And again, we turn to the daily lectionary. We are still reading from the letter or the sermon to the Hebrews. Chapter 9 tonight in its entirety. Uh, on Holy Saturday, it seems like uh, two weeks ago now, but Holy Saturday, we had the uh, the vigil of Easter, so that uh, went well past nine o'clock, so there was no devotional that night. And then yesterday with Easter Sunday, a number of different services and stuff like that, uh, and we took the night off, um, having celebrated the great feast earlier in the day a number of times. So picking up where we left off in the daily lectionary, we are now in Hebrews chapter nine. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense, the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties. But, on the, but into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet opened, as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a defiled person with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since the death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood, for when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, 
He took the blood of the calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified. The copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once, to bear sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And that is the word of the Lord. Again, that's chapter 9 of Hebrews. And again, many of the ancient scholars, and myself included, not being too ancient, but uh, is that St. Paul wrote this, um, but we can't say definitively. So we hear at the beginning of this, and this is a beautiful juxtaposition of what happens in the earthly church and how it reflects of what's actually happening in reality. Same thing happens today. You know, in, in fact, uh, uh, God promises to be among us, but you see me, you see baptism, but we know that in baptism you're being washed. Scripture tells us you're being washed with the blood of Christ. Uh, in the Holy Supper, you're receiving the body and blood of Christ, that same body and blood that was crucified you know, 2,000 years ago um, on the cross, and rose again from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. You're receiving that body and blood, given and shed for you. Why? For your forgiveness. Um, he is there with us. And, uh, and they are pointing us to not only the reality that's there, but what's happening in heaven. Now, that's kind of a mystery, because wherever Christ is, there is the kingdom of God heaven and earth meet, if you will, in the divine service, as they did in the time of the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament uh, church, the tabernacle, the tent, was reflecting the reality of what was going on in heaven, as our churches do today. Again, with the font, the altar, don't have to, you, you need the water, um, not the font necessarily, whatever vessel you have to hold water. And, you, you know, we have some sort of table to have the elements for the sacrifice placed on, but sometimes that's just a you know, a bedside table at the site of a hospital, etc. But again, that's the, the we build our churches to ref, reflect the reality that we cannot see. So we hear about this first covenant, the Old Testament tabernacle, about the high priest, the holy place, and the most holy place. The holy place is that place out, so there's the veil, and then um, the, the holy place is outside, there's the altar, uh, the bread of the presence, the incense, uh, the lampstand. This is, by the way, where Zechariah goes, as we hear, you know, the priests go there all, you know, frequently. A lot fell to him to take care of the oiling the lamps and arranging the bread of the presence and trimming the wicks, etc., like that, uh, make sure the incense was in order. And uh, it is there where the angel Gabriel is waiting to tell him that he will have a son, that son will be John the Baptist. Uh, but then the holy place, which is on the other side of that veil, is where the high priest could go once here, as we hear in this text, as we hear in Leviticus as well. That's And there's a lot of allusions in this. Uh, not so much allusions, but it's pointing us directly to the Day of Atonement. That's uh, chapter 16 of Leviticus, which is, by the way, right in the center of the five books of Moses. Right in the center is this Day of Atonement. Yom, Day, Kippur, Kafur, uh, Atonement. So anyway, um, the priest with blood, always blood, because the blood testifies. Remember, it's the, uh, the blood of Abel that screams out from the ground. The blood testifies. Uh, the blood of Christ that we're covered with in our baptism testifies. Uh, it, it screams righteousness, and not our righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. So we stand before God with that blood testifying, if you will, for us. It cries out uh, for us. It cries out for Christ. Anyway, 
um, we hear about the high priest could only go into that place once a year. And remember, he carries the people in, in with him. And he's got them on his breastplate, on the tiara, on his head, a holy to the Lord, and all the nations of, of Israel, all the tribes of Israel are, are engraved on these stones, on his breastplate, and actually on his shoulders as well. And into he comes. All this is what happens for us, as we're told in Hebrews, is what's happening in Christ. But the most important thing here in this discussion is the Day of Atonement. That the high priest had to do this year after year for himself and for the sins of the people. All his blood. Christ does it. And this is mentioned a couple of times. Christ does it once for all. That's once for you. And he enters into, brings us into the presence of God through his blood. It's really a remarkable thing. Um, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and so when you are thinking your sin is too great, think of Christ. Think that you are covered with his blood. When you think that God could never love you, think of Christ. And think that you are covered with his blood. That Jesus shed his blood for you once for all. And that all includes everybody, including you. So we hear in this beautiful passage, again, this is chapter 9 of Hebrews, about how the redemption is ours finally, eternally. We heard that word in there too. Through the blood of Christ our Lord. Uh, and so we now have life. Uh, the resurrection. You know, is ours because of Christ. All right, and there's a, a lot we could say about this section, but we're already you know several minutes in, and we'll just have to stop there as we continue with our prayer. We put the litany to rest for a while, so we'll just say um, the prayers as we typically do on this night when we're not during uh, in the season of Lent. So we can begin by confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, we turn to page 294, and this is just the guide uh, that helps us focus our prayers on a particular theme or themes on a specific day of the week. So Monday, um, we pray for faith to live in the promises of holy baptism, for our calling and daily work, the unemployed, the salvation and well-being of our neighbors, for schools, colleges, seminaries, for good government and peace, plus um, our, our prayer list, uh, people who've requested our prayer. So let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and having been joined to that resurrection and the death and the forgiveness of sins which comes through those mighty acts in our holy baptism, we pray for strength, for faith, for the work of the Spirit, that we may live out the promises of our holy baptism. That as we go about our various callings and the various places that you take us throughout the day, our work, our families, or interactions throughout uh, our life that we would again live out the promises that you have bestowed upon us in our holy baptism that we would be the light and the salt in our communities we ask you to be with the unemployed that they might find gainful, gainful employment and the underemployed that they might find a, a, a better pay and uh, and the and that they be provided for the things with the things they need to support uh, their families and their lives we ask you, as always, to be with our neighbors. We pray for their salvation and for their general well-being, and whether they believe or not, that they would come to know you, and that, again, we would be instrumental, that we would be your tools as we reach out to our neighbors. 
bless the schools and colleges and seminaries of our church and really throughout the land, that they may teach your good and gracious will. Bless us with good government, with people who are eager to do your will. Stop those who by their words and actions sow the seeds of hatred and discord among us, that we might have peace. Be with those who are crying out for healing and have requested our prayers, our brothers and sisters in Christ, Dave, Lucille, Dawn, Dennis, Betty, my brothers in office, Tony and Nicholas, friends of our congregation, Jason, Josiah, Joe, D, Dylan, Katie, Marge, Carrie, Julie, Jill, and again, all who are crying out to you. Heavenly Father, place your hand upon them. Keep them ever mindful of your love, and according to your gracious will, heal them. All these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, soul, all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to sing an Easter hymn. Uh, this was written by the first president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, a wonderful man by the name of C.F.W. Walther. You may be familiar with him. Uh, all of us pastors are very familiar with him, having to read a number of his wonderful writings. This is He's Risen, He's Written. He was an accomplished uh, organist and hymn writer, and this is one of the hymns that we have of his in our hymnal. He's risen, he's risen, Christ Jesus the Lord. He opened us prison, the incarnate true word. Break forth, hosts of heaven, in jubilant song. And earth, sea, and mountain, their praises prolong. The foe was triumphant when on Calvary. The Lord of creation was nailed to the tree. In Satan's domain did the host shout and jeer. For Jesus was slain, whom the evil ones fear. But short was their triumph, the Savior arose. And death, health, and Satan he vanquished his foes. The conquering Lord lifts his banner on high. He lives, yes, he lives, and will never more die. Oh, where is your sting, death? We fear you no more. Christ rose and now open his fair reading's door. For all our transgressions his blood does atone. Redeemed and forgiven, we now are his own. Then sing your hosannas and raise your glad voice. Proclaim the blessed tidings that all may rejoice. Lord, honor and praise to the Lamb that was slain. With Father and Spirit, he ever shall reign. And that's him 480 by C.F.W. Walther. He's risen, he's risen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Have a blessed night, my brothers and sisters, and by God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.